everyone, I'm Marketa Rehrova. As you can see, I'm holding a microphone, but you're not hearing me any louder. That's because we are actually recording uh, this lecture and streaming it online. So if you'd like to hear anything again, you will be able to, to uh, on our website or on our social media. Uh, but uh, Coming back to why we are all here uh, is that uh, Farm in the Cave, actually, we, we are a feature company and we create authorial pieces that are based on long-term research. Uh, and during this research, uh, we delve into various topics that uh, we feel are very important to our society and have a and potentially will have a much greater impact than uh, we can see we can feel now uh, and uh, during our research we always uh, try to talk to different experts and that's actually how we met Ivan Strömen um, uh, a few years ago when we were working on a project called Commander that was about extremism uh, and this time we are dealing with, uh, or we are working on a project that's called Online Hero, which will premiere uh, in this January. Uh, so you're welcome uh, to come to DOCS Center for Contemporary Art in Holeshevice uh, and see the premiere. Uh, and in this project, we are uh, addressing uh, the phenomenon or the, prob uh, the problem of uh, the spread of misinformation and conspiracy theories, uh, and again, the impact uh, that might have on our society, on, on, or on uh, our relationships, or, or just on our daily lives. Uh, and during this research, we collaborated with Ivan Sturman, who, of course, uh, is dealing with extremism and misinformation and uh, the dark corners of, uh, uh, of the Internet for a really long time now. Uh, he even figured as an expert witness uh, during the process or w during the trial with Anders Breivik. Uh, and uh, we did not uh, want to keep Oivent to ourselves, uh, and that's why we decided to cooperate with the Faculty of Science Sciences uh, to organize this lecture with the support of EA grants. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Ivan Sturman. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I'll try to use my, my theatre voice because, um, uh, well, having a microphone doesn't work. Um, first of all, um, what I'm going to talk about from what the destructive force of conspiracy theories and, and about power and powerlessness, and, and although I'm being introduced as an expert, I guess that means I've read lots of books, um, I'm, I'm, my approach to this is, a, is as a journalist um, and, and my work uh, into, well, my research into conspiracy theories, uh, into extremism, uh, into these topics have been as a journalist. And they say that a journalist is someone who knows less and less about more and more uh, and in the end knows nothing about everything. Uh, while an expert is the other way around, someone who knows more and more and about less and less and, and in the end knows everything about absolutely nothing. Um, so so that's, that's the kvit. Um, I'm going to start. Um, what's interesting me is what, uh, what is the relationship between conspiracy theories and power and powerlessness. And as I was preparing this uh, talk yesterday, I was also looking at uh, a number of videos from Germany from the 29th of August in 2020 uh, when there was a big demonstration in, in Berlin. Uh, around 38,000 people were gathered in Berlin to demonstrate against Corona measures. And uh, although most of those demonstrating were peaceful, uh, there was also several uh, instances of, of violent riots, actually, and, and uh, fights with the police, etc. <laughs> one of them outside of the Russian embassy, uh, and the second one outside of the German Reichstag. Uh, and uh, around 300 people ended up storming the stairs to the Reichstag. And I've been looking at a number of videos uh, of that, from, from that event, from that demonstration, uh, and yesterday I came across uh, a video that was published by Welt and uh, I thought it was quite interesting just precisely in regards to what I was going to talk about today. So this is of course 
a video of a demonstrator. He is standing there. He is actually uh, holding a speech about the importance of love and understanding. Uh, <laughs> You might be surprised. He's talking about world peace and the necessity of it. Um, uh, in the background there, you will see uh, a black, white, red flag, which is the old imperial flag of Germany, because quite a number of the people that were involved in these demonstrations were sympathizers of the so-called Reichsbürger movement, uh, which essentially is a movement that believes that the federal state of Germany uh, is illegitimate uh, and doesn't actually exist as a state, but is more of a business or uh, just an occupation authority from the Allies after the Second World War. Um, they are also uh, have clear similarities to the so-called sovereign citizens movement in the United States, and you see freedom, sovereignty, and also uh, a mention about peace written there. The well, interesting thing about this man, who is uh, also a believer in conspiracy theories, is that he is wearing a t-shirt that says Trump Putin 2020. Um, and I, I, even though this man is, is probably a very good example of an individual who does not have much power, who is rather powerless, and, and the demonstrators around him also, are, many of them are there because they feel powerless in, uh, in, in, uh, when, when sort of facing the corona measures and facing the, the, the things that are happening to their society without them being able to influence it. Uh, at the same time, he's referencing to very powerful people and seeing them as ideals. Um, so, uh, I thought that would be a good starting point uh, because I think that there is something there, something that we should examine further. But to do so, uh, I'm going to go back in time and I'm going to start in 1869 uh, and I'm not expecting anyone to be able to read this because first of all it's written in Gothic letters and secondly it's written in Dano-Norwegian or mostly Danish because this is so far back that uh, we didn't really have a Norwegian language that was written. So, uh, but there was an article in the newspaper, Morgenblade, in 1869, because in 1869 there was a rumor going around the Norwegian capital uh, at that time called Christiania, nowadays called Oslo. And that rumor said that uh, the Freemasons were secretly uh, catching people, especially fat young people, um, to butcher them and to put them on barrels uh, with salt uh, to be able to export that produce uh, to the Turks. Uh, so this rumor was going around. It had actually been going around for decades uh, in, in uh, both the countryside outside of Oslo and in Oslo itself, amongst the so-called lower classes. Um, and in 1869, in September of 1869, this rumor led to riots. Uh, people were gathering outside the, the uh, uh, building of the Freemasons in Oslo, and they were really rioting, and police had to intervene, etc., etc. And I was reading about this story, uh, and I was thinking to myself, now, doesn't that sound familiar? Uh, doesn't it sound a bit like what happened in Berlin on the 29th of August where rumors were going around? Actually, there were rumors in Berlin on the 29th of August 2020 that Donald Trump was in Berlin and he was there to finally be able to save the German people. And uh, they even had a speaker uh, outside of the Reichstag, who said that now uh, he is here, uh, we will have to show him that the Germans want freedom, that the Germans want peace. That's when the storming of the Reichstag stairs started. Or we could start another place, starting with a rumor, ending with riots in the capital. Well, here's a rumor. Um, this rumor is about Pizzagate. Pizzagate, the belief that in a specific pizza restaurant, in Washington DC, um, in the cellar, um, children are being kept and are being uh, mistreated and also uh, 
well, killed, but in the process of, of them being killed, uh, a, a chemical substance called adrenochrome is being harvested. That's the legend. Um, according to the idea of Pizzagate, this is something that involves leading politicians in the Democratic Party in the United States, uh, such as, for instance, Hillary Clinton. Um, and uh, all of this is based on a number of emails that were leaked through WikiLeaks uh, where uh, people in the Democratic Party were talking about pizza. Uh, but according to people that were doing interpretations of these emails, uh, they were not talking about pizza, they were talking about children being abused. So for instance, cheese pizza uh, in this worldview would be a reference to child porn. Um, and Mike Cernovich here uh, was a figure of the alt-right at the time in the United States. He really believed that, okay, Pizzagate is a huge story, it's not going to go away, it's all going to be exposed. Um, there were a number of people that believed in this story. And in the end, actually, one man uh, from North Carolina took it up on himself to drive from North Carolina in his Toyota Prius all the way to Washington DC, to this specific <coughs> pizza place, storming into it, carrying an AR-15, uh, waving this around and wanting to, to see the cellar because he wanted to go into the cellar to release the kids that were held captive there. It turned out that the place didn't have a cellar. Uh, he was arrested and served years in prison, but uh, the belief didn't really go away. The rumor grew, it grew into this. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware, I know this looks like a mess. Uh, because this is the map, this is the so-called QAnon map. This shows how everything is connected um, in, in the understanding of the QAnon conspiracy theory universe. Here in the middle somewhere uh, is the Pentagon and Nazi Germany. There is uh, Israel, CIA, there is lots of uh, mentions of like, here's Tesla for instance, uh, Foo Fighters for some reason, uh, Pythagoras, uh, Babylon, there, there's so much stuff here and it's all connected and it's very unclear how it's all connected. Um, but the claim is that there is some big story that is being shown through this map. Um, of course, QAnon, basically, if you want to boil it down to the fundamentals of it, it's the idea that there is a secret source, or there was a secret source within the Trump administration, a source named Q. And that this source would reveal to people how there is actually a war going on, a secret war going on between the Trump administration and the so-called deep state. And the deep state being a satanic force. A force that, for instance, is involved in precisely what was claimed or what was alleged around Pizzagate. This sacrifice of children, this harvesting of adrenochrome. Um, but also involved in all kinds of other evil plots. Many, many evil plots. And well, um, that rumor uh, also played a role in uh, riots in the capital. But this time, not Christiania. Uh, not Oslo, but Washington DC. In the middle of this picture, which is a screenshot from, from video taken by Vice News, uh, there is a poster saying the storm is here. It's also an essential belief in the QAnon world, that there is a storm coming, there is a day of reckoning coming, and this day of reckoning, uh, well, everything will become known, the truth will finally come out, and, and the people that are responsible for all the crimes of this so-called deep state, they will finally be punished for what they have done. And that day is referred to as the storm. So where you see this, the storm is here, it's a direct reference to this. Of course, it wasn't the only reference uh, to Q and to QAnon on that day. Lots of people were QAnon effects, t-shirts. People were holding up posters referencing the QAnon theories. And so they were, in fact, if you look at the 29th of August in Germany, 2020. Um, at the moment where people were storming up the stairs of, uh, 
of the Reichstag. There were people there in yellow vests reading where we go one, we go all, a QAnon slogan. So these rumors can grow. They can become something real and something tangible, uh, like riots in the capital. They did so in 1869 in, in Norway, and they did so in 2020 in Germany and in 2021 in the United States. So that, of course, leads us to, to having to deal with conspiracy theories. Somehow we have to deal with conspiracy theories. Um, and, and my point of view is that very often when we talk about conspiracy theories, we don't really have a critical approach. Uh, we talk about conspiracy theories, uh, but we don't really discuss them in a way that also raises important questions about society, which I think we should. So I have listed three things that I think we should do, and which I will do uh, in the rest of this talk. Uh, I want to discuss conspiracy theories as a phenomenon. Um, I want to discuss them as a problem, and I want to discuss them as a symptom. And I think all three of them are important. So let's begin with the phenomenon. Here's a quote. Um, Ari Hegelon, he's a Norwegian uh, conspiracy theorist and one of the rather few QAnon believers in Norway at the time. Uh, he was taking part in a demonstration uh, against corona measures in Norway, uh, outside of the parliament building in Norway. And he was pointing behind him, at, directly at the parliament building, and he was saying, behind me, you can see the Catholic Church. Norway, of course, being a Protestant country. The long arm of Rome. No one there works for the people. And this is somewhat original, because it's an anti-Catholic conspiracy theory mixed into it all. Uh, but the idea is that no one there works for the people. They're in some evil plot, and that evil plot just happens to be Catholic. Um, and I'm, I'm taking this, this example here because this is not really a theory. And because very often when we talk about conspiracy theories, uh, someone will raise their hand and say, well, uh, conspiracies are real. They happen, don't they? Uh, which obviously they do. Uh, I mean, there's been lots of conspiracies throughout history, and, and also conspiracies involving powerful people. Um, Watergate comes to mind. Um, and, but this is not really a, a theory about such a conspiracy. This is a very concrete accusation. And I believe that it's important to understand that conspiracy theories are, in fact, accusations. It's not a theory that in the, t in the cellar of this, or in the basement of this uh, pizza place in Washington, there is uh, gruesome things being done against children by leading democratic politicians. That's not a theory, that's an accusation. They're saying that is going on. And those accusations are also very often closely connected to pre-existing enemy images. Uh, so what are those? Well, we're surrounded by enemies, and here I'm borrowing from Jesse Walker, who's written a book, an excellent book, called The United States of Paranoia. We have the devil in the wilderness. There is an enemy outside of the city walls, threatening us from, from the outside. Uh, something foreign, something we can't understand, something we can't relate to. Uh, there is a, 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 a something there that is threatening us. If you we think back to the early United States, or actually before that, when it was still a colonial place, uh, this would be the Indians, or the Native Americans. They were the devil in the wilderness. They were up to something, and they were up to something that wasn't good. Uh, what were they up to, and who were they in cahoots with? Of course, we also had the devil next door. And, and in Norway, back in the 16, oh, the 17th century in Norway, um, there was, uh, in, the, in the far north, uh, there was a lot of conflict between the Norwegians and the Sami population. 
And in the beginning, the stories were like, okay, the Sami population, they were not real Christians, so they were up to <laughs> no good as well. Uh, their religion was weird. Uh, they were having these shamanistic rituals. Okay, that, that's obviously witchcraft. But eventually, rumors started spreading that there, were, there was witchcraft going on inside the Norwegian communities. The witches had come inside. The witchcraft had become part of the Norwegian communities there. And they were also a, a danger that was being posed against society, threatening to tear down society from the inside. This, of course, is, is also something which is often levied against minorities. Jews, Muslims, Catholics, whatever minority, that it seems to be a good scapegoat. Of course, there is also the puppeteers, uh, the people that sit behind the power and are the real power, the Illuminati, the people behind the New World Order, the people that really govern, the people that are not visible to us but are only pulling the threads from above. Very classic, also enemy image. Um, and then we have the beast below. There is something going on in the underclass. And what are they going to do? They're going to tear up society. They're going to change society. Uh, they're going to make it different. And maybe they're in cahoots with, with someone on the outside. Maybe it's going to be a slave rebellion. Uh, maybe it's the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, maybe there is someone who is going to threaten how our, the very fabric of our society is made and they come from the underclasses and they're going to change everything. And what is this? What is this plot? And who are they in cahoots with? So all these enemy images are often put into, and all these stories are often put into the conspiracy theories. And I'm not saying that these images are always wrong. I mean, sometimes there are, in fact, enemies on the outside. Sometimes there are people inside society that might want to threaten it. But these images are going together with the accusations in the conspiracy theory stories. And that's the important thing about it, they're stories. A conspiratorial worldview, Michael Barkin, who's a leading scholar on the field, uh, says is made up of three factors. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing is as it seems, and everything is in fact connected. Just like that enormous map, the QAnon map, where all these factors that seem completely random are put in one context. Everything is connected. Cause and effect, everything is connected. But that's not reality. What it is, it is quite often a good story. It's a story that will have some similarities to stories that we have often told ourselves as human beings throughout the ages. You can find some of it in, even in the Epic of the Gilgamesh, uh, one of the oldest stories there is. But, but let's for just moment, one moment drop Gilgamesh and think about Star Wars. What is the story of Star Wars actually about? It's about a small group of people uh, fighting a good cause. Um, their good cause is they're working to reestablish this, this um, republic that used to be. There used to be a good-hearted republic, but this good-hearted republic was changed from within by evil forces that turned it into a dark and evil empire. These uh, Sith lords, as they were called, or as the story would be if it was not in Star Wars, but in, on the internet, on some alternative use, <laughs> websites, not the Sith Lords, but the Illuminati, not the Sith Lords, but Shoros and his people. It's the same story. It's a relatable story. It's a story of good and evil. It's an old story. And I think that's important to realize, and I also think it's important to realize that conspiracy theories are in fact very human. This is the uh, Kanisha Triangle, named after an Italian uh, physicist, I think, uh, who made this uh, symbol. 
And uh, of course, um, if I ask people, what does this show? Uh, some people might see uh, two triangles here. Um, some people might see two triangles lying on top of three circles. Some people might see a David star. In fact, none of those things are there. Uh, and this is an example of how we see patterns. As human beings, we see patterns that are not real, that are not actually there. It's an old thing. And it's, it has been beneficial to us. If you imagine the ancient human walking around on the savanna in Africa, and there's movement in the grass. Now, that movement could be a snake. It could also be the wind. But it might be beneficial to believe that it's a snake, even when it's not. And that's the same thing we do. We do it all the time. Two people are in a room. They're talking. The third person comes into the room. The two people that were there stop talking. The third person believes they were talking about me, weren't they? They were saying something nasty about me. Uh, we see patterns, even when there are no patterns. We look up on the evening sky and we see the stars, and the stars are figures, even when there are, in fact, no figures. That's very human. And I think it's important as well when we want to discuss conspiracy theories as a phenomenon, not only to look at the excesses and the extremes, but also to realize those two things. They are A, good stories, that will have some kind of connection with, with uh, stories that we have often been telling ourselves throughout history. And B, they allow us to see patterns, even where patterns don't exist. They can explain the world where we feel there is a lack of explanation. So that is conspiracy theories as a phenomenon. Now, what about conspiracy theories as a problem? Of course, conspiracy theories, in many ways, are a threat. Uh, this is Daryl Johnson. He's a former analyst uh, for the Department of Homeland Security in the United States. He's written an excellent book called Hate Land, which is about different forms of extremism in the United States. And he says conspiracy theories, they are, in fact, the, the oxygen of extremism. Such theories, he says, come back packed with emotions. They explain the world dualistically as good versus evils and often provide easy scapegoats for complex societal problems. It's important for extremist groups. So yeah, that's a problem. Extremism is a problem. Challenges to democracy and all that. Uh, of course, there are things like this. Here we have anti-Semitism from the 20s in Norway. We have anti-Muslim ideas. We have anti-Catholic ideas. Uh, conspiracy theories are often used to explain why minorities should not be trusted, why minorities should be, in fact be controlled, why minorities should be kept out, etc., uh, etc. Et so that's also a problem. Um, but there's more to it, even, even if you consider this, because conspiracy theories, are, they are also a weapon. They're also being weaponized. They're being used by oppressive regimes, such as, for instance, in, in Belarus, to explain away opposition, to portray the opposition as being evil or in cahoots with foreign forces, dark foreign forces. They're being used by authoritarian populists, like Viktor Orban. Uh, Soros, of course, uh, being a, a very wealthy financier who has been involved in some rather murky deals, uh, is a perfect enemy, perfect person to point at, to explain that, okay, this is th these people are up to no good. This is part of a dark conspiracy. So uh, the Hungarian authorities can, can put him on, on, on posters and, and tell him, to not tell people not to let Soros have the last laugh, and, and, it being, uh, the, and um, it's a saleable message. Or you can have the more concrete message that someone has tagged onto the poster on the picture to the right, namely, Dirty Jew. Um, it can also be used in information warfare, 
obviously. It can be used to undermine trust. Uh, we have seen that a number of alternative news sites, as it were, have been used to undermine trust in liberal democracy. We have seen that people that are uh, promoting anti-liberal democracy point of views in various European countries have been invited to talk on channels like RT or Sputnik. Uh, this is conspiracy theories being weaponized. Not by people that are powerless, but by people in power. Uh, we can go on. This is uh, lots of portrayal of Soros. Uh, lots of uh, messages that go hand in hand. Because on one side, Soros, as I said, wealthy financier, has been, he bet against the bank, the, the English British bank, and he won uh, in, in, a, in a move that uh, lots of people would say wasn't very ethical. Um, uh, and he is really, really rich. So if you are powerless, it's easy to see Soros as an example of a, a person who has lots of power just because of money. But if you are in fact in power, it's also easy to portray and sell Soros as the enemy to get the focus to be somewhere else than on yourself. So in the, in the left side here we have a Norwegian <coughs> former leftist, uh, former communist uh, actually, who, who now is a conspiracy theorist and promotes all kinds of ideas. Uh, and here he writes about Soros and the Kiev regime, dinner with the devil. Uh, they were having George Soros, could he be an antichrist? Soros controls the world, here is uh, spread on, on, on 4chan, 8chan, similar places to spread this idea of essentially a pro-Nazi point of view. All of this is, is taking place and they're exploiting <coughs> powerlessness. But who is exploiting it? That's my conspiracy theory. Someone is also up to no good. And there's also, of course, this thing. This is a quote, flooding the zone with shit, uh, from Steve Bannon. Um, and this is also a problem with conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories actually derail important debates. Take the debate about vaccinations, for instance. In, in 2009, there was uh, a flu going on. Uh, sort of corona sort of suppressed the memory of this flu, but the swine flu of 2009. Uh, and there was a big discussion in Norway and in some other countries about whether it would be a good idea to vaccinate people en masse against this uh, or not. Um, and this was a debate. In the beginning, it started with a debate that was saying that <coughs> where people that had from a medical profession had different point of, points of view. Some people were saying, well, uh, this inf influenza is not that serious. Uh, there might be risks involved in using this rather untested vaccine. Uh, there might be problems with some of the additives that are used in these vaccines. Uh, at least some people should refrain from, doing, from, from getting this vaccination. Maybe in particular, the pregnant women should avoid it. Um, and other people were saying, no, this is not a problem. It would be worse to get sick from this flu. But this was a medical debate. And it was a legitimate medical debate between people that had some kind of, of, of relevant uh, education and competence to talk about it. Not people like me. I don't know anything about vaccines. Uh, but what happened in Norway was that this debate was completely derailed because some people turned up that claimed that these vaccines were in fact part of an evil plot. Uh, and that they actually contained this microchip from the CIA that were going to be used to, to, to um, increase surveillance of us so that the CIA would know everything we did. Uh, and these people were even invited into TV debates against people from the medical profession. Uh, and, and the debate that was a result of that was nonsense. It was completely meaningless. 
There wasn't a debate. It was people just hurling shit. Uh, the result was that the debate that had been between people of medical profession, that debate was dead, it was gone. Although that was a relevant debate. So, flooding the zone with shit can be a method, but it can also be the result. It can be a way of derailing a debate, for instance about gun control, but it can also be the result of conspiracy theories. Now, so that's a problem. So, we can identify a number of problems but then there's the symptom. Conspiracy theories as a symptom. Uh, there's been quite a lot of research carried out. Uh, and what that research shows is that on a societal level, things like bad times, it could be economic regression, it could be uh, th a threats that are actually made against the society, it could be rapid changes, it could be wars, it could be a pandemic. Uh, things like this will lead to uh, conspiracy theories finding more fertile ground. They will sell better, as it were. Polarization as well uh, is a factor that will make them sell better. Uh, and, the, and distrust. If there's a lot of distrust in the society, if you don't trust your government, if you don't trust the media, if you don't trust the academics, uh, then it's easier for conspiracy theories to come in and replace those sources of authority. An example here is the Mad Killers of Brabant. It's a story that you might not have heard about, but in the 1980s there was uh, a number of really violent robberies of supermarkets in Belgium. And people were killed in these robberies uh, that were like overly violent, it didn't make any sense with all this violence and the, and the outcome, what they actually managed to get out of the, the robberies, the people that were behind it, were, were rather small. So there was this like, it didn't feel right. And, and those people that were uh, behind those robberies were never caught. They're still not caught to this day. Um, at the same time, there was a number of terrorist attacks that hit Belgium, both from the extreme left, uh, from uh, people on the extreme right. There were some Palestinian terrorists that hit in, in Belgium. Uh, at the same time, there was lots of crime that went unsolved. Uh, the police didn't really work very well. Uh, all of this led to, and the, and, the, and the political sphere, there was corruption scandals, there was lots of things going on at the same time. And all of this led to distrust in the society. And all this distrust led to a number of different theories about what was really behind the mad killers of Brabant. Could it be the CIA? Was this a stay, stay behind operation? Or was it uh, extreme right-wingers that were behind it, trying to derail society? Or was it something else entirely? Who was behind it? Was it something that was done just to, to make problems for the one chain that was of supermarkets that was usually hit, namely the last? Or was it something else? All of these theories came because of the distrust that was there in the first place. And, and if we look on the individual level, Distrust is also, also, also a factor there. If you, as an individual, feel that you cannot trust the authorities, maybe for good reason, maybe you've been trampled, maybe you have actually suffered something, but you feel that you don't trust the authorities, then you're more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. If you feel that you're in lack of control of your own life, then you're more likely to, to believe in conspiracy theories. Because actually there was a, a, a study done in, about this where two groups of students were given a number of questions to measure whether they believed in conspiracy theories or not. Uh, one group of students was given this list of questions just before a normal lecture. The other group was given the same list of questions just before an important exam. And it turned out that the students that were going to have that exam and felt really nervous about it, probably, uh, were more likely to believe conspiracy theories. Because they didn't feel in control. And, and think about what that means in, for instance, a society that has been struck by a pandemic. And we have 
strict corona measures in place. You don't feel in control over your own life. You can't go to work like you used to. You can't go to university like you used to. You can't even go outside like you used to. If you want to go to discotheque, it's not possible. And think about what it means in a society that is affected by economical crisis, by impacts of high power prices, by impacts of, of war, even if war is not taking place here, but nearby. That means something. That has an effect on the individual level. And there's another thing. A conspiracy theory rarely shows up on its own. If you start believing in one, you're more likely to believe in others as well. There was a study uh, showing that people that thought that Osama bin Laden were not, in fact, killed in the raid in Abbottabad, uh, were also, but because he was still alive, um, and he was then working with the Americans, um, people that believed that were also more likely to believe that Osama bin Laden uh, was not killed in the raid of Abbottabad uh, because he was already dead. They were more likely to believe that he was both alive and dead at the same time. And that's because it's not the alternative theory that matters. It's the disbelief in the established theory. It's the disbelief in what the authorities are saying. Because if the authorities can't be trusted, now what could they be trusted about at all? If you believe that 9-11 in 2001 was carried out by the Americans themselves, now why would you believe anything else that the Americans tell you? If you believe that the moon landing was faked, well, why would you believe in anything else? They come together, they grow together from one theory and they become a universe. But this also has some consequences if you want to approach conspiracy theories as a societal phenomenon and from a critical point of view. Just like the fact that they are in fact quite human also has some consequences. Because of these things like distrust, a feeling of lacking control, alienation, if these things actually play a role, then, well, maybe that's what needs to be addressed. Let's uh, quote Joseph Osinski. He's a leading scholar um, on conspiracy theories. And he has said, conspiracy theories are for losers. And he underscores, this is not a statement he makes in the pejorative sense. No, no, he means it literally. People that fall outside of society, people that have lost elections, people that are outside the mainstream, those people are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. Research in Germany shows that if you look at it from a political specter, there is a U form. If you're in the middle, safe somewhere in the middle, you're not that very likely to believe in conspiracy theories. But if you're on the left or on the right, you're more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. Just because you feel distrust to the mainstream. You don't feel they can be trusted. There is an important lesson for those of us that, for instance, want radical change, that we have to be careful when we promote radical change, not to do it in a way that also promotes conspiracy theories. But there's more. Here's back to the article that I started by showing from Molenblade in 1869. And this time I've translated a bit of text from it. Because very often when conspiracy theories are discussed in society, in Western societies, we end up by saying, oh, we should, we should focus more on source criticism in schools. Uh, people should be learned how to deal with misinformation. Uh, this is things that should be debunked on, on websites, specifically made to debunk things like this. Uh, and this was the approach in 1869. One would really think that those times must have long since passed, at least as far as the capital was concerned, when the less enlightened classes of the population believed that the Freemasonry was engaged in secretly slaughtering people, putting them in barrels and exporting them to the Turks. And then they go on to actually complain a bit about uh, their competitors in the media that are not taking this seriously. 
before they say, likewise, it would be desirable if school teachers were tasked with clarifying the school children's concepts in the face of this rumor. So, debunking, let's get source criticism into school, all of that. But if we are to approach conspiracy theories critically, you have to realize that maybe there are some factors behind growth of conspiracy theories, behind why people believe in them, that deal with societal problems that are not made up, but they are very real. A critical approach might indeed demand more of us. And that's the point that I want to make when it comes to conspiracy theories, power and powerlessness. Thank you very much. Questions, and I, I will just pass on to anyone who has the question. I will just pass the microphone so we can record it. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, just a brief question. When we're talking about the conspiracy theory as a phenomenon, there is a word you referred to a, a couple of times in the lecture, uh, both when we, when we were talking about the, um, the way it is seen from below and how it is, it is being seen in the academic circles, mm. and it's the word devil. Mm. And um, necessarily or unnecessarily, this also can be a part of another conspiracy. Mm. Uh, when we're talking this much about uh, devil and we also mentioned uh, Christianity. Mm. Um, I was wondering if, and when we're talking about phenomenon, we as people, there is a very big chance that we're raised with very deep-rooted um, conspiracy theories, such can be the religion. <coughs> and I was wondering if, um, in the academia or in expert circles, there is a discussion about this, or this is some sort of a taboo topic <laughs> that is still remaining uh, unspoken. Is it being considered as such? I, 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 I mean, I get the question at times. Um, on my field, if, if I was an academic, then my field would be religious studies, because that's what I've actually studied. Um, I think that it's... it's uh, it's difficult to, to, to sort of draw the comparison and, and there might be taboos involved indeed. Uh, but at the same time, there are two aspects that I think are important here. And one of them is that once again, there is something very fundamentally human about these stories. And they're stories about good and evil. Now, religion often also has stories about good and evil. That makes these stories, the, the conspiracy theories, that they, it makes them relatable. It makes them accessible in a sense. Maybe in a secularized society, they also become a replacement for what was explained in the past by, by devils or demons. Maybe we instead we, we can explain by pointing at dark conspiracies. Um, and that's an interesting discussion. Uh, uh, is, there, is, is there something to that? Is, there, is, is this some kind of modern day demonology? Uh, but I think that maybe, and I think that's an interesting discussion, absolutely. But I think maybe also that's a bit sort of uh, uh, one of my point of views, or my, one of my points is that conspiracy theories are entirely normal for human beings. I mean, we all, to a certain degree, believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, the difference between some of us and others is, is the size. How big are the conspiracy theories we believe in? We might believe that two friends are up to something together, and that's a conspiracy theory as well. I mean, even go and accuse them. Maybe we're too polite to do it, but, you know. Uh, 
and and I think that's because some of this some of this tendency to see patterns etc is, is very very human, and and I think that that's more interesting than uh, <coughs> and then we enter the field of psychology and social psychology rather than the field of religious studies, which is my field, academically speaking. So I don't know if that answers the question at all, but there is. Uh, <coughs> but the discussion is, I've, I've seen and heard uh, the question, and, and there are people that discuss it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Yes. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, I agree with you uh, in the, like, or at least I like that you explore the motivations of the conspiracy theory believers rather than like uh, being mean to them. And I would like to ask you if you have any strategies to talk to these people, to people who believe in conspiracy <laughs> theories, because I know that they, uh, they feel powerless, they feel the fear, etc. And is there any, um, any option to talk to them and not deepen their fear or uh, even like anger towards mm -hmm. people who try to uh, derail <laughs> their track away from the theories? Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm very, it's very fascinating uh, actually to go abroad and talk about these issues. So I'm used to talking about them in Norway and I'm getting exactly the same questions. Uh, so so this, it's, uh, that's fascinating in and of itself because it shows that we're kind of in the same boat. Um, but um, this is, this is, of course, it's a very difficult question uh, on the surface of it. And, and what should you do if you actually have a personal relationship to someone who, who has started believing in some wild, outlandish stuff? And it's not easy to answer. And in some cases, it might be best for you personally not to have anything to do with that person. Uh, but in other cases, it might be best to have contact, but never touch up on the subject at all. Uh, just avoid it and go on fishing trips instead, I don't know. Um, but this is the reason at the same time that I'm very concerned with, with what I feel is the lacking uh, uh, critical approach to conspiracy theories because I think that very often uh, people that believe end up believing in, in large grand conspiracy theories in, in, in these universe theories about these evil plots that are actually ruling the world very often it's about real tangible stuff that is actually going on in their own lives uh, and that has some root in reality. Uh, and that might be also uh, a result of politics, indeed. Um, and, and so in those cases, my advice would be try to find out what's actually behind this. Don't go into a discussion about the Illuminati uh, or the New World Order uh, or, or, or the plots of the, of the LGBT community or whatever. Uh, don't go into those discussions because those discussions will drag on forever and they will not lead anywhere productive in my point of view. But try and figure out what's, what's behind this. Uh, what's actually going on uh, and is there something real there, something that can actually be addressed uh, by you or by someone else. And I think that's an approach. Uh, and I'm not saying it will always work or that it will always lead somewhere, uh, because I know for a fact that it won't. Uh, but I believe that it's, uh, it's at least a better approach than just to, to point and laugh at, at ideas that we think are strange. OK, so it's time for the last question. Uh, well, it's just a follow-up question. Um, what can be this thing in reality then that uh, people base their beliefs on? What, what, do you have an example of that, maybe? Yeah, it can be a number of things, but I, one of them is an actual feeling of powerlessness. Uh, you feel like you're not in control of your life, uh, and that could be based on, on actual things that have happened, you know? Uh, it could be a conflict with the authorities. You've had an actual conflict with authorities. Uh, some, something has actually happened uh, that has made you distrust the entire system. Uh, it could be uh, a result of, of uh, alienation with politics. You feel that no, no politician is actually addressing the issues that, that are impacting your everyday life. 
so then it becomes a political question, how do you address that? And I'm not going to pretend <laughs> like I have an answer to how politicians should address it, but I, I think that if you, have a, if you see a political system where there's a distance, large distance between the people that are voting and the people they're voting for, uh, for instance, this will, this will lead to conspiracy theories being more widespread. If you have corruption scandals, things like that, it will also lead to that. Uh, or it could be things like unemployment, uh, lack, of, lack of cohesion in your, in your daily life, lack of friends, lack of contacts, lack of social life. I mean, I think in the corona crisis uh, and the growth that I, in my opinion, there was a growth, of course the statistics here are a bit unclear, but in my opinion, it was a growth in conspiracy theories there because precisely because people were left more on their own, uh, not only uh, being on their own, uh, having less social uh, contacts, but also actually uh, having more time to be on the internet and reading stuff that they maybe should have not spent so much time on. And, <laughs> and so there are factors there. So but what I'm uh, thinking is that you should, th this is at least an area that should be explored and if we explore this area then we might find things where, it is, where there are good reasons to criticize society, where there are good reasons to raise political questions. Uh, unlike when, when conspiracy theories tell us about something wild outlandish, uh, <laughs> those are not good reasons to, to stand up but maybe there's something behind them, which is. That's my point. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid it's yeah. time to finish it here. So <laughs> on your behalf, I would like to thank our colleague, Eivind Strömmen. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and I would like to thank uh, the theater group uh, Farm in the Cave uh, for inviting him. So thanks, and thanks you for being with us. Okay.